Okay, good evening guys. Before we get started as always, let's do the custom instant poll. Let's check everyone hear the volume correctly. So on your screens now, let me know if the sound is perfect, too loud or too low. Uh, pretty much the standard settings as it always has been, so majority of people saying perfect. That's great. Thank you guys. Okay, we're going to continue with the Trade for Life course tonight. So we're going to move on from the whole reason why we have a trading plan, what it's all about, and the different incarnations it can take. Again, it's not about you know having this huge complex plan that you know you have to rigorously fill in it's just about having some basic goals some basic ideas being able to stick to them being able to replicate when you make trades and being able to improve upon trades when you lose trades so been a lot of volatility in the markets the last um, few weeks after the swiss cap and you know different things you know filtering through the world's just a very unsteady unstable place right now nobody knows what a long-term investment's going to hold nobody really knows where true value is i guess so you know, seeing the inevitable weakness in the euro dollar, we're seeing a bit of a, a punch on for gold at the minute. People are, you know, trying to push that back to the 1300 level. And the stocks, you know, again, still pretty high. I mean, the DAX is anticipating the QE from the eurozone, so it's moving ever higher. And the rest of the markets are following. So I guess it's one of these things. You know, the kind of old-fashioned way of trading has gone, I think, of having, you know, a balanced portfolio of bonds, you know, commodities, uh, you know, stocks and currency. Just isn't really kind of that same correlation anymore, you know. The indices are making new highs and gold still making highs. You know, where where is value? You know, what what are these correlated and in, in, you know inversely di directly correlated markets really trying to achieve? So uh, interesting, interesting conditions out there. But the whole point is, once we've got a plan, some goals, we've got an idea of what we're trying to achieve. So what we're going to do tonight is move on from that and understand um, what we're trying to get from the planning and routines, how we set out our stall for the day and how we trade key figures and data. Hi Gus, yes, you've missed one and two. Um, it doesn't really matter, Gus, oh, everything's recorded. So um, I can just uh, I can just put the link on that for everybody. Um, so we can just, anybody else can go back. Um, you just go back to the, the archives here and just go to TFL uh, one and two. You can just watch it at your leisure. But all, all the courses, you know, follow on from each other and they're individually contained, but it, it is a series. But uh, the first part that you missed was all about a trading plan, setting goals, what it's all about. This is all the individual elements over the next uh, four weeks that fit back into your trading plan. So we start, as always, with the risk warning. Remember that spread betting and CFD trading carry high level risk or capital, shorting losses that exceed your initial deposit. The matter is suitable for everyone, so please ensure you fully understand the risk involved. The information comes provided here in the no circumstances are considered no solicitation to invest, nothing here can shoot investment advice. Information provided is basically accurate the date it is produced. Again, educational only content the webinar as opposed to opinion of the moderator not intro.com. Content is not country financial investment or tax advice. Intro.com is not subject to any liability of the content goes during the session. So, how do we plan now for later success? So having clear and defined rules and sticking to them is the key to being a successful trader and having a long trading career. That's the way we have to really look at it. It's not just about um, getting involved in the markets and making some money. You know, we're trying to kind of realistically, you know, have a career around these things. So not as easy as it sounds, unfortunately. A lot of people uh, come into trading you know, with high hopes and, you know, good amounts of money and quickly get disillusioned. It's like never having any golf lessons and going out and expecting to play like Tiger Woods. You know, the markets are massively, massively competitive and there's a lot of people um, trying to take your money off you. So if you're not prepared and you're not for a, a robust, solid plan, your chances of success are marginal uh, at best. So making rules and calculating risk in order to reap the rewards, it's easier than you think. However, it's a lot harder to follow. Okay? It seems that people when they start to trade have absolutely no problem putting money in their account, have a, absolutely no problem trading. It's just when it becomes a little bit harder than people expect and it takes a little bit longer to make money and you don't make as much money as you think or it isn't quite as, you know, it's not as quite as it says on the tin. You know, I think a lot of people just expect to get into the market, so they put five, ten thousand pounds into an account, and that's quickly going to start generating the money. Fortunately not. What it quickly does is generate money for other market participants and the broker. Because if you're just getting into lots and lots of trades and making very small amounts of money or even scratching, the only person really making any money out of that is the broker. So unless you have some kind of set specific goals that you're trying to achieve over a day, week or month, then really, you know, it's very, very hard to keep that motivation, okay, because, you know, you, you pile into the books, you know, you read things online, it's like, right, well, I'll put all that stuff that Steve talks about, 
into uh, into play and we'll get on with it. And unfortunately, uh, the reality is very different than the theory. So again, it's a lot about being methodical, trying to take the emotion out of it. And the emotion that you take out of it comes from repetition. Yeah, the competent. The confidence you get from doing things over and over again and it being right, yeah, is just that is the way forward. There's nothing worse than an unconfident trader, and there's nothing more difficult than trying to get out of a losing slump. So how to start? Well, the internet's a powerful resource for trading. Okay, we have to remember that credible information can be pretty hard to find. So you've got to pick your sources carefully. Be very wary of things that promise guaranteed results. Be very wary of things that, you know, again, a uh, offered guarantee success. Nothing. Nothing exists. Okay, so it doesn't matter if it's a trade follow, if it's a trade signal service, if it's you know a trading room, if it's webinars like I do. You know, if they promise something they can't deliver, then they're probably too good to be true. So there's a reason why we don't promise anything in our webinars, but they're also free. So I don't charge you for my webinars. And if you want to do anything, you know, on Intertrader, we look after you. So we give you free resources because we know investing in you is going to make you better traders, and everyone's going to be better off for it. But there are loads of forums, websites, books, and speakers. You know, too many to choose from, to be honest. And again, it just goes back. If it's too good to be true, it is. Look for people that are reputable, people who have been around for a long time. Again, I've been chief market strategist and trader for four years. I've been an FX Street for four years, written books. Uh, well, written our book that we published very soon. Uh, three software packages with Metastock, MT4, and Tradable. Um, is that enough credibility? Oh, risk manager at Revco, uh, floor manager at Snyder's biggest trading floor in Europe, and uh, I don't know, I think that'll do it for now. But if you Google me, I've been around, you know, so it's not in my interest to try and rip people off or make a quick buck. I'm with InterTrader for the long term, so the education I try and give you is, is is the best that I believe, you know, we can we can bring to you. So when you talk about achieving trading success, the key is to know what's relevant to you. You will not trade like I do. Okay, we've got 28 people in the room today. You will all see the same information, but interpret it in a different way. That's why the market's difficult. Okay, so you can be happy buying the tops of the market and getting a small amount as the markets blip up and try and hunt out stops. You can be more suited to taking long-term positions. You know, above or below the moving average, trying to you know pick out them big swing trades. You can be a scalper, a position trader, momentum trader, anything you want. Okay, it doesn't really matter. All that matters is that you understand what you're trying to achieve. And what these boundaries that you put into your own trading, you know, how they're meant to help you. Okay, because just putting, you know, a load of charts up and putting a load of screens up in your office doesn't make you a trader. Just like, you know, having letterheads, business cards, you know, on a website doesn't make you a businessman. All these things, you know, are very, very hard. Hello, Rudy. So hard to stick to your homemade plan. Absolutely, Rudy. Rudy knows from personal experience because Rudy has joined me on uh, many, many webinars. And, and you know taking advantage of my software and yeah it is hard Rudy you know again it's it is hard if it was easy then everyone would do it all I'm saying is that you know if you're not prepared for these realities of trading then just don't do it go and spend your money somewhere else because trading is all about you know being prepared being methodical and to some extent it's a little bit boring okay so we all get a buzz out of making money and you know having that danger of losing money but to be good and successful at trading you have to make it quite mundane and say okay you know Wait and wait and wait. Yes, I've seen this a number of times. This is what I do in this scenario. Da, 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 da. Wait. Ah, there's the fake out. Right, I've made some money. And then you do that day in, day out. That's the reality of trading. If you expect, you know, you're going to turn on your computers and be transported into Wolf of Wall Street, uh, I don't really know what you're expecting. You know, trading's, you know, a long slog where you have to do a lot of technical, a lot of fundamental analysis, and basically be patient. And your rules will help you be patient. If you don't have rules, you'll get bored, you'll trade all the time, and that's right, you'll lose money. Or you'll lose confidence. And I don't know which is worse. Because once you lost confidence, you can never make money anyway. Once you've got no money, you can't trade. So, chicken and egg. So, a lot of uh, this, this plan, plan, then plan some more goes through all my webinars. And that's why I start webinars with a lot of theory. And the way I wrote the book was a lot of theory, then a lot of practical stuff. And again, you know, my editor, you know, funnily enough, said, you know, well, it's a bit hard to read, Steve, sometimes. You know, it can be a quick, you know, boring. I was expecting some more stories. I'm like, well, what do you want? You want to, tell, you know, tell the story of Steve roughly and all the things I've done over my life to do with trading and money, et cetera, et cetera. That's, you know, not a great book for teaching people to trade. If you want to teach people to trade, unfortunately, the steps you have to follow 
and ways you have to think about how you approach the market and what you're trying to achieve. And it's like, you know, this is kind of, this is why people write books to impart knowledge, not to tell a story. If you want to read a story, go and watch a film, you know, watch a Wolf of Wall Street. If you want to make some money, then you have to do things like plan and do things in the book and in the course that I continually go through. So we need to think about, you know, again, my basic rules. The markets move 80% of the time in a technical manner. Because if markets don't move, all them little bankers out there and all the traders don't make any money, do they? So you have to have an excuse for trading. That's called technical analysis. And then from that point, we have all the um, you know, fundamental news that drive the markets. Okay? So that's all the other things we want to look at. We want to understand that moving, you know, markets moving by uh, fundamental information are, um, you know, a, a, again, all the things that drive the market, the news, all the things we find interesting, all the things you know, from the central banks, you know, figures that are released, etc., etc. So what I would say is that we have to understand basic things, what products we want to trade. Self-analysis, give ourselves some sort of trading state. So our trading state is basically, are we ready to trade? Have we got a clue what's going on? Or are we just winging it? You know, are we bored or do we want to actually make some money? Okay, evaluation of overnight trades uh, and, and, and daily market news. Okay, so that's going to happen all the time, isn't it? There's going to be market news. You know, there's going to be uh, things happening all the time. We need to be aware of it and understand if it means anything to our trading. If it doesn't mean anything to our trading, then discount. If it does mean something to our trading, then use it. Okay, so again, all these things are absolutely you know, with, uh, within our control and things we should be looking at, to, you know, to, 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 to incorporate to our trading all the time. Then we've got evaluation, uh, well, we've done that, sorry, and then we've got today's goals, what we're trying to achieve in monetary terms and in just kind of, you know, trading terms. You know, do I want to do three trades today, five trades today? Do I want to find the low in product X, Y, and Z? Do I want to, you know, again, whatever you want to trade and how you want to achieve it is down to you. Then we've got technical analysis of your market and other correlating products. So, again, you're trading gold, what's happening in indices, you know, what's happening in silver, what's happening in the euro dollar. Then your watch list, a list of things that's you know particularly important to you, you know, something that you want to get involved in, something that you want to trade on a uh, and trade from on a regular basis. So this is again down to the things that you find interesting. Like I said, if you're the trader, you have to take responsibility for these things. I would say that you have to do two of these six steps. And it will mean different things to different people. Some people will be all about goals. And they'll be all about the money, all about goals. Not to say it's wrong, but set them goals out. Yep, other people will be all about um, the watch list. So marrying up them key technical levels and then key fundamental events and getting involved. Okay? Other people will be just purely technical analysis. They won't like the fundamentals. They'll try to fade them out, which is fine. But you have to be aware of the big fundamental news and the underlying, you know, effect it has on the market. Because if you just keep, you know, buying every you know low in the stock market it keeps going down well then maybe something fundamentally is telling you that you know the ma the market has changed we're not in a bull market anymore we're in a bear market so stop doing things that you know that mean they won't be profitable to you so what products do you trade well there are many different products you can trade and some will suit certain types of trader more than others and products you can trade are really down to you and i think what annoys me the most is people early on when they're not experienced in trading Try and pigeonhole themselves. So it's like, I can only trade the FTSE. I can only swing trade. I don't do any of the type of trading. We're all essentially just momentum traders. So be it short term or long term, we're looking for that initial direction in the markets and trying to get on the back of it. So the products you might think you know how to trade are like the euro dollar, because you hear it banded around all the time. The FTSE, because you read the FT, or you're working in London. Or gold, because everyone knows about gold, don't they? Do you really know about gold? Do you know how governments use it as a store of wealth? Do you know how it is meant to be a guard against inflation? Did you know that 11% of physical gold is held in jewelry boxes of Indian women? Do we know that Fort Knox is rumored to be empty? Do we know that Germany is trying to buy it back? Do we know that the Swiss didn't want to uh, put equal amounts of currency reserves um, in gold? Do, do we know all these things? No, you don't know anything about gold. Okay? Nobody, nobody knows, really knows everything. Unless you kind of really dig into these things and, and go into all the scenarios, you don't really know how gold acts. It doesn't matter. You don't have to. Okay, what you have to know is how does it move, how does it react, how, how you trade it on an on a intraday basis, on a 15-minute on chart or an hourly chart. And the FTSE, sure, it's just made up of 100 top UK 100 companies. If you look to the balance sheet of BP, do you know what BP's long-term strategy is? No, I don't either. I've got no interest in that. What I want to know is, is it valuable? Do people want to buy the FTSE or do they want to sell it? My uh, views on the euro dollar are clear. Mario Draghi has got it wrong. The euro is massively in trouble. You know, everyone else is taking the U.S. stopped quantitative easing, talking about raising interest rates. 
you know, the uh, UK sort of raising interest rates, normalizing the economy. Eurozone, negative deposit rates and bringing in quantitative easing from where? Where's the money going to come from? Where's Germany getting this money from? Okay, so that's why I'm negative on the, on the euro. So I sell every high in the euro against other currencies because that's where I see value. That's a fundamental view. I still have to do that based upon technical levels. And then products you think you don't know, okay, the, the, the pound versus the, uh, the South African rand. Do you know much about that? No, I don't either. Doesn't mean you can't trade it. WTI is going down. Once you spotted a trend, it's already too late. So we've bounced back up to $50, already back down to 48 Yeah, I think 43 maybe, maybe as low as 36 Okay, intrinsic value in, in oil is always going to be. You know, it's an inelastic demand product, and it's just a big power shift to worry Russia and uh, some terrorist states. Yeah, can't bomb them. So what do we do? Take your money off you. Simple. So when it comes down to trading, you know, all these things are just data. They're just bids and offers, and it's just, you know, where, where you're trying to find value. All we're ever trying to do is marry up that 20% fundal, fundamental driver of the market and news, and then try and put that into an 80% um, technical analysis framework. So anything that moves, you can trade. As long as you understand the 80-20 rule, as long as you understand the markets will move uh, between support and resistance, and it's trying to get to value, you can trade anything. I can put a chart up of anything. You can don't have to tell what even what the name of it is, and I can tell you what is likely to happen in the future. Okay, that's the stage you want to get to. Okay, and don't be too fooled by thinking that you understand the FTSE or gold or whatever, you know, or the pharmaceutical industry just because you're working it. Markets move in their own way. Okay, market traders are a unique being, and they make things move and they make decisions not based on normal things. Okay, so. What we have to do is interpret what the market thinks, the collective market for that fundamental driver, what the technical boundaries tell us are achievable, and then what the difficult thing is to marry up what we're trying to achieve. Okay? So where we want to trade, what we want to make, and what we want to do. Once we understand that, we're ahead of other traders. And it doesn't really matter what the markets do after that. As long as we know how we're going to interact, what we're trying to achieve, and how we can make money, then we're a lot better suited to, uh, to being a trader. So self-analysis, it it, we're going to move on to in the, in the kind of psychological um, part of, of this, this, uh, this course, or the, the psychology side. And really, it just means that what's your trading state? So it's, it, are you set for today's trading? Lots of different things can affect how you feel. You might not be able to sit at home trading all day. You might have to do it on your lunch hour, or you might have to do it after work. And these put different stresses. You know, not being able to see your charts or your positions puts different stresses on you. People, you know, again are just people. They, they deal with stress in different ways. You know, you might have, um, you know, had an argument with the missus, and you've done a, you know, an, an angry trade. Seen people do it. Seen people lose ten to thousand pounds doing that. So these are real things. Again, you've got to ask yourself practical questions. You don't have a risk manager. You don't have a mentor. You don't generally have somebody you can talk to about your trades. You've just got you and, and your own head. So you've got to ask yourself some sensible and practical questions and refer back to your trading log just to give yourself an idea that yeah, do you know what? I've got a fair chance of making some money today. I'm not just going to be bored, sit here, and just trade things because I don't know what's going on. Yeah, I feel good. I want to make about £200 today. I'm willing to do that in three trades, and I quite fancy picking some bottoms in gold and selling some tops in the, in the in DAX. That could be your trading plan. That could be your self-talk, and it gives you some sort of basic targets. It sounds obvious, and it sounds simple. How many people actually do that? If you do these little tiny things, and again, you write some little things down, like some levels, some ideas, you're going to be a better trader. So you can ask yourself things like, how did you perform yesterday? Are you worried that you have to make money back? Or are you feeling a bit cocky? Because you made loads of money yesterday, so even if you lose a few hundred quid, you'd be fine. Again, that can affect your mental state. Did you hit your target? Did you get stopped out? What's your opinion of the market? Was it right or was it wrong? If you still make money if your opinion's wrong, the whole point of being a good trader is being market neutral. Okay, so buying things when they're going up, Selling them when they're going down. Having some idea of why you're doing it, of course, but not just pigeonholing yourself to only do one type of trade. Market doesn't want to go up, stop buying it. Yeah? Doesn't mean you have to sell it, but stop buying it. Yeah? If the market keeps going down, you keep buying every low, then what's the point? Stop doing it. Einstein's theory of, of madness, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. So it doesn't matter if I think gold's going to continue to go down. If I keep selling you know, every high, and it keeps going up, that's stupid. I have to stop that. And I have to refer back to my self-talk and my trading plan to think, why am I giving money away? Yeah? 
my opinion's wrong, so why am I giving money away? Psychological side is underrated. It comes in many different forms. And it can be, you know, as I said, the self-talk, referring back to a trading plan, goals, rules, all these different things. And realistically, you know, it's very, very difficult, isn't it, to kind of give yourself that confidence, especially when you're on your own and when, you, you know, you haven't got that depth of experience, you know, to have traded different types of markets, different types of, you know, economic releases and, you know, just been around it for as long as, you know, people like I have. But, you know, you can always ask questions. You can always, you know, ask me a question on Twitter or send me an email or, you know, get me on Skype and just say, what do you think, Steve? You know, because it always helps to have someone to, to talk to. And it can be said, you know, that I agree with you. It's as simple as that. Or, you know what? I don't agree with you. And this is the reason why. Not to say I'm right or you're right or I'm wrong or you're wrong. You know, opinions are just opinions. And I think that's what's something that's perhaps what's missing from uh, trading right now. It's having somebody who properly, you know, interacts as a mentor, risk manager, and also a trader. And that's why I'm kind of thinking about starting a trading room. But I don't know. It's just a lot of time to invest. So identifying how you performed previously helps you to identify improvements. So you're either trading well and you're making money or you're trading badly and losing money. So the key to trading psychology is knowing that state. If you're trading badly, change it. Do something about it. Don't see, keep losing money doing the same thing. Okay? The most difficult thing that I try to put across is you have to be a bit stoic. And that gets confused as boring. So you don't have to be boring as a trader. Traders are renowned to be very flamboyant. I have been flamboyant. One of my nicknames was you know, Champagne Steve. So I've done it all. There's nothing I haven't done. You know, Even tossed the old odd dwarf. So I've done plenty. Okay, I have nothing to prove in that respect. But to be a good trader and to make money trading consistently, um, that isn't it. You know, none of that stuff matters. It's about having, you know, your, your, your rules, having this nice framework, you know, which I show you all the time on my, uh, you know, on my live webinars. And I show you, you know, in color coded words support, words resistance, and just being able to look at the markets every single day and knowing, you know, where highs are, where lows are, where value is. And just keep looking at that day in, day out gives you that ability to almost have a second sense to know when things are overbought and oversold, where to quickly, you know, do value. As I was speaking, I just hesitated about five minutes ago. I just bought the low in gold. Gold just came down to a 50% level, bought it, yeah, made 50 ticks. So as I was speaking to you, I've got my charts open, and that's what you have to do. So who says men can't multitask? It's just one of these things, isn't it? You see it, you might only get a split second to get in, you make 50 ticks, and that's done. That's, that's trading. That's the world we've got to be in. And you can take it to the extreme. You can look at the charts 20 hours a day, kill yourself, or you can be smart, use a framework, you know, again, just keep your eye on the markets when you need to be. And if you see something, hit it. Get in, get out. That's trading, guys. Okay? Yeah, I mean, I need to co-op with another one or two traders uh, for a room. Yeah, I mean, I, I, luckily I know one or two traders. I've been doing this for a long time. So, uh, yeah, I mean, again, I, I don't know really. I don't know if I can give that amount of time or it would be enough money for me to make it worthwhile. But um, hey, it's just an idea. So as I say, emotion is the killer in trading. Letting yourself be fooled or bullied out of trades you know, is one of the most common things. The market is the most efficient way of um, bringing fear into the market, bringing fear into traders. It just knows. It can smell fear. It can smell stops. And again, the whole thing why I teach you about understanding how the big boys trade is they know you're trading a 1% risk or maybe tops 2 or 3%. So if we're you know, hitting 70 in the RSI or 30, it can be manipulated for a short amount of time to get people out. It happens every day in the markets. So again, what you have to do when you're sitting down to trade, ask yourself, have you just considered all the things you need to to trade? So the evaluation of overnight and daily news is something people do, but only on a cursory glance. So we don't have the same correlation, I'm afraid, these days with the Asian markets and what happens overnight in a ripple through to the morning. But, you know, markets are traded, you know, 24-6, and teams of people work 24 hours around the clock to, to make sure there's very little edge. So you see very few gaps, and you see very few easy kind of trades. But that's just the way it is. You know, a lot of people watching the markets, so a lot of things happen. But you have to be aware of things that can affect the markets. And even, you know, if they don't affect the markets, so if the Nikkei drops off 300 points overnight, and, you know, don't expect the FTSE to open lower. If anything, expect it to open higher. So, again, put some tolerance in. So, you know, to what the market's telling you based upon the news. 
So I'd say that news and analysis really can uh, break down to three sections for me. So regional based, relevant sector, and general news. So regional based is, you know, again, think about this. The U.S. Uh, data will, will affect all markets, okay, all markets. You know, U.S. big news will affect that. Stuff out of China, not so much. Stuff out of the U.K., generally won't affect the eurozone or the US so make sure the market you trade you understand the, the regional quality of it okay so UK um, and eurozone is one then you've got the US then you've got the emerging markets so again make sure you're in tune with what's happening with the products you trade the relevant sector again if you're trading stuff like gold then you don't need to look at agriculture or anything to do with soft foods it's not not really going to affect your market so again make sure you're looking at correlated and in diversely indirectly sorry correlated products uh, to get an idea of what could be of value. The general news, anything to do with policy changes, EU quantitative easing, Greek elections, Russian sanctions, terrorism, all that kind of stuff. You know, again, it's it's a sad state when we live in the world. Um, when I saw the uh, the incidents in, in France, um, you know, the Just Sweet Charlie stuff, and um, yeah, it's sad, but unfortunately, you're kind of not surprised, are you? You know, we're on the imminent terror attack in London, and it's it's just the way we live our lives these days, and it's sad, and it's you know. You know, very depressing to some respects. But you know, these are the kind of things that move markets. So, these are the kind of things we need to understand if the market's pricing them in, if it's expecting them, and if these events happen, you know, what we do. You know, that's the world we live in. It's our job. So, general research you know about the economy is always a good preparation. So, understand inflation. Okay, what inflationary pressures mean, how they're measured, you know, what they mean to you. Inflation, bad. Inflation is controlled by interest rates. Interest rates have been low, historically low, kept low. So we don't even know what inflation is. All we know is that things have gone up in above inflation except for wages. So actually, we're all a lot worse off than we were. But house prices have gone up, so we all think we're all happy, you know, happy, happy chappies, but we're not. Okay, so when house prices go down, in accordance when interest rates go up, the whole thing kind of gets a bit messy. So remember, you know, you can only know so much, and don't try and over cram things into your head. As I said, 20% of news uh, and your preparation is just reading headlines, okay? Because the market's only moved 20% of the time due to actual news events, which are a set time, or news, big news. You don't hear them very often, okay? So the rest of the time is all about your technical analysis, knowing where support is, knowing where resistance is, knowing what you're trying to achieve. <coughs> so again, we've gone through the fundamental news and Look out for commentators, people that you respect on Twitter, you know, trusted news sources. You know, again, you know, news is news. Just like when you read columnists in your favorite newspaper, you know, have the same for the financial aspects. People have spent, say, more sense than others, and there'll be people that you want to listen to and people you just don't want to listen to. So find them out. You know, again, get your Twitter lists, get, you know, your Facebook feeds, you know, get your, your all your information should be delivered to you instantly, easily. None of this information is hard to find. And then other key supporting indicators would go to a little bit later on. So your indicators, oscillators, other things that will give you an idea of you know, if your trade is a good idea or not. So open position and orders. If you're a very studious uh, trader and you work the order book and you have a lot of orders in, you know, trying to fit the other extremes of the market, the highs, lows, support, resistance, then you know, you're going to stack the order book. And this comes with its own problems. Uh, you know, again, you can forget orders, you can miss orders, you know, you can close your trading screen down and not take these orders out of the market and you get filled. So you have to be very diligent if you're doing this style of trading. And this generally, you know, is more for the traders that like to be, you know, very, very technical and you'll know, trade lots of different positions and, and trade, you know, for the extremes and look slightly longer term. But if you are this type of trader, make sure that you're aware of your, your positions at all times and your orders. So again, it's always generally when you're running longer positions that you have, you know, bits where you want to buy and bits when you want to sell. And again, you know, it's unscheduled news, overnight news can affect these things. So you understand how long you're willing to hold these trades for and what you're trying to achieve. And again, it all goes back to your trading plan. You know, if you're a, an overnight trader, you're going to have a different view of the markets and trade in a different way than an intraday scalper, aren't you? I mean, again, if you're trading three positions and you're only trading once or twice a month, then you're going to be building into positions over value areas, not buying at individual prices to get out for short-term trades. So again, your trading plan has to reflect if you're stacking the order book or just getting in a market. So technical analysis, you know, is a massive part of your routine. You know, again, every time we do any live trades, you see my charts like this, and there's lines, support, resistance lines, pivot lines. Okay, 
red for selling areas, green for buying areas. It's just the way it is, okay? So this is what we're trying to achieve. We're trying to achieve on any product that at any time we can understand where it's going to go, where it's going to stop, and what we're going to achieve. And that, again, your points of attraction, your levels, your break or bounce levels, support and resistance levels, whatever you want to call them, they should be almost second nature. Okay, you shouldn't be left up to chance. You shouldn't be putting these lines on your charts as the market's moving. Okay, that's sacrilege. Them chart lines should be on, yeah, ready for you to trade. So if you see you know, the euro dollar hit a low and you want to buy it, that should be hitting a level you've got down. You should be not analyzing the chart and drawing in lines as it happens. You're just not going to make any money trading that way. So again, checking your technical patterns, trend tools, oscillators. You know, it needs to be relevant to what you're trying to achieve and what you're trying to, uh, you know, do as a trader. So, you know, if you're going to be checking your, your charts every 60 minutes, fine. Every 30 minutes, 15 minutes, fine. It doesn't matter. Every day. Again, it has to be down to you, what you're trying to achieve, your trading style. I can't tell you what this is, unfortunately. You will only know what time you've got available to you and what works for you. Some people love just to sit and watch the charts all day and not really do much. But then, you know, if you're not making good money trading, what you actually sat there for? Yeah, your time has to have a cost benefit. So if you're not making fifty pounds an hour, you know, so you're not making say three hundred pounds a day and you sit there for six hours, then you know what's the point? What's the point of trading? What's the point of being interested in trading if you're not actually making the money? So your watch list. So your watch list for me is just a bit of a I guess it could always be a cheat sheet for your um trading plan. So what matters to you? Okay? What products matter to you? What levels matter to you? What direction? What trend styles? You know, what things you know, are you interested in trading? What inter things are you interested in doing? You know, the, these are the things for me that I want to look out for um, all the time. So do I want to um, you know, get involved in the euro dollar? And do I want to trade that from the, the low side or the high side? You know, what, what, is, is it, what is being of interest to me for, um, you know, for these particular products? You know, you, you, watch, you watch this is something that only you should kind of like know about. So it's like, yes, well, I trade the DAX and I always trade the ZEW, okay? Or I trade the euro dollar and I always focus on, you know, candlestick patterns or you do the Bollinger Bands and the RSI. You know, these are, you know, the things that you're always constantly looking to, um, to get involved in. And, and, you know, having the, you know, there's no fixed formula. There's no way I can just say that this is the ideal scenario for doing a watch list and this is what should be included. You know, again, it's down to you and it's down to experience. It's down to what triggers your trades to get in, to get out. We know what floats your boat. You know, that's what's important. So things to look out for, I guess, in, in general terms would be, is there a trend change or continuation? You know, the trend is your friend. You know, that's an underlying rule of trading. So are you going with the trend or do you think it's time for a change? So note down levels, areas of interest, key significant, higher time frame, levels of support and resistance, previous highs, previous lows, anything that could be of interest and could be of use to you further down the line. So refine these areas, and again, specifically, you know, to individual trades you're going to do. So work out the type of position you're going to put on. So what's your entry? What's your profit target? Where's your stop? Is it a fixed stop, a trailing stop? Does it fit with your goals? Okay, so if you're putting these into your watch list and your idea of what you're trying to achieve, then really it becomes fairly simple, fairly one-dimensional. You're trying to buy or sell at this point, get out at this point. Simple, fairly one-dimensional. You're trying to buy or sell at this point, get out at this point. And if you're wrong, get out for that point. Three elements to each trade. The rest of the things make it confusing, the over-analyzing things. So looking at your risk and reward for a trade, I guess is one of the most important parts. Because once you've done that, you're generally going to answer all them previous questions. So if you're willing to put £50 on and you're willing to risk £100 and want to make £200 or £250, then you know, there we go. You know, we've got an idea of what we're trying to achieve based upon what we're willing to lose. So that really is trading. So once you've done all that, then you should know when you put a position of £5 a point where your stop needs to be, where your exit point needs to be in order to fill in them criteria. So really, again, you're the trader. You need to prepare and, again, understand if you're trading different products or you're trading, you know, simultaneous products or correlating products or trading, you know, baskets of products. You have to understand what your margin is, what, you know, we can possibly achieve. Now this all fits together. So routines are something that I generally find helps. And, you know, routines tie in with a trading plan, they tie in with your watch list, they tie in with all the things that, um, 
you know, we really think are interesting in trading. So realistically, you know, we're trying to understand what we want to get out of trading, what we want to do. So the market hours are all about monitoring potential positions, tracking the technicals, keeping an eye on the fundamentals, looking out for the news, looking out for movements. They're not for doing all the things we've just said. They're not for doing your trading plan. They're not for putting support levels in. They're not for reading articles. When you're trading, you're trading. So you're out there looking at the markets, trading. All you should be concentrating on is finding areas of, you know, that are of value and buying and selling in order to make money. So your routine could be that you just check the markets every 15 minutes. It's only four times an hour. Or you check the, the markets once an hour. And you're just looking at the chart saying, right, okay, well, I read some news this morning. I've got an idea what the market's going to achieve. These are my technical levels. So this is what I'm going to do. Okay, low point, buy it. High point, sell it. And that's your routine. So again, going back to when you check the charts, how you get involved, that's what you're trying to do. Then after hours, well, that's your time. That's all about trade analysis. Once you've got no open positions or you've got nothing on, then you get involved in the markets and you do whatever you want to do. The markets are closed, so you, you generally don't have a position on. So you can do whatever you need to, can't you? You can, uh, you can go through your, your trading plan, see if you hit your goals, see if you didn't hit your goals, analyze your trades, were they good trades, were they bad trades? You know, how did you feel mentally, emotionally? You know, how did you feel, you know, with your trading state? How did all these things kind of marry up? You know, was it a good day in the office? Was it a bad day in the office? That's what you want to be doing by your routine after hours, giving yourself, you know, a little bit of time, a little bit of downtime just to think and process what's happened. So really the conclusion is the key to a successful daily routine uh, and having these, this repetition and this idea of a watch list, a trading plan, you know, having some kind of guidelines of what to do is that it has to be enough information to aid you but not hinder you. A lot of people go OTT with these things and just try and put too much into it and end up just getting lost in the world of trading, getting lost in the, in the world of trying to find the perfect trading system, getting lost in trying to understand what the, the banks in the world is trying to achieve. And, you know, again, it just becomes too hard. Successful traders, you know, set a plan that's personal to them. And successful traders get involved in the markets in a way they understand. So successful traders are just normal people. That's a professional mentality, and that's what you have to have, professional mentality, in order to protect yourselves in the markets and, you know, be able to get in and out, you know, relatively unscathed. If you have a bad trade, know it's bad early enough to get out for a relatively small loss. Or if you get into a good trade, get some profit out. Don't just leave the money on the table. So, again, after hours, during the day, is all about focusing on trading. Don't try and do anything else apart from trading. It's hard enough just to trade, let alone trying to do analysis, trying to do, you know, fundamental and technical studies, you know, trying to figure things out. So that should all be done before you trade. All you should focus on is making that money. After hours, do what you want. Rate your performance, write war and peace, you know, analyze yourself, go look in the mirror, give yourself good talking to. That's what after hours is for, okay? It's having them two definitions. And really, practice makes perfect. Your routine you know, it might take a long time at, at the beginning, but it will be refined down. So your morning routine could be 15 minutes, yeah? And, you know, bank traders, you know, get it down to a fine art of maximizing their research time. You know, and again, it's different, you know, okay? If you're going to be, you know, a, a long-term bank trader, you need to do more than 15 minutes. But to trade the markets and get involved, you need to do, you know, a basic overview of the fundamentals, have that technical viewpoint in play, and then again, you know, be able just to get in and out of the markets relatively safely. So remember, professionalism pays. You know, you might not be a pro trader. doesn't mean you can't set out your plan and stall like a professional trader. It's difficult and it's hard to follow, as Rudy says, but if it was easy, everyone would do it. There are no quick fixes and there's no shortcuts. That's just the way it is. That's the price of trading. Don't like it, do something else. So key figures and data. So trading figures and uh, key fundamental data it gives you an opportunity not just to make money, and you know, obviously you can lose money, but not just to make money, but bring a structure into your trading day, week, and month. I know when all the big figures are out, as do you, because you get free economic calendars, and we know when the big events are. Non-farm payroll, first Friday of every month uh, at the same time. Simple. So we can say there's maybe five to nine good economic data releases a month. Well, that's five to nine mornings or afternoons we can take care of our trading. So that's why I like fundamental information. Bits of, you know, Guaranteed news like the ECB, Bank of England, Fed, great, great source of information to potentially move the markets and to let us trade. So if we've got that down and that in our plan, 
that we've already got an idea of what we're going to do for a certain period of the day, week, or month. I like that. So you don't get caught up in noise when you're trading the event because you're waiting for it. If you just sat there bored and trading the markets because they're going up and down, that's when you get bored and trades. That's when you get caught out and lose money just for the sake of it. So knowing when the key speakers and times of economic release is imperative, it's all free, it's all out there for you. What's expected from the markets on these figures? Well, again, we've all got access to, to previous charts, data, and time. You can understand what these uh, figures mean to the markets. Um, what figures do you trade well and the ones you don't? If you never make any money off non-farm payroll, don't trade it. Okay, if you always make money in the ZEW, trade it more. Uh, check your journals and logs. And again, you know, check things that you've done in the past to try and repeat them in the future. Okay, that's what trading is all about. If you uh, haven't been able to make money from certain types of trades and certain uh, things, then you know, you've got to stop doing it. There's no point trying to, to beat yourself up and try and make uh, money out of figures that you don't either understand or you know, get on particularly well with. You know, if you don't make money, then we have, to, we have to stop doing it. That's, that's the whole point of, uh, of trading. So research and planning is um, the approach to trading fundamentals. As I say, we should always know when these things uh, are planned to come out and what's important and what's not. Understand the difference between inflationary and growth data and understand what the market's looking for. Understand the good and bad news principles. Good non-farm payroll data sends stock markets up, farm markets down. That's how it works. And the US is the biggest consuming nation on Earth, biggest economy on Earth, no matter what anybody says, no matter what China says or the, or the IMF, whatever. Yeah, the, the GDP per head is $42,000, dollars $43,000 in the US. It's something like $4,000 in China. It doesn't complete, compete, it doesn't compare. So uh, there's absolutely no point um, discounting any US data. It's all about uh, US data. It's all about uh, you know, the biggest economy on Earth driving uh, the, the world market. So anything that comes out of the US is important, and you should look at. If it's growth, employment, GDP, debt, uh, you know, anything. It's important. Anything that comes out of it from the U.S. is important. So these things stack in reality. And again, like I said, whatever you're looking for, news-based and uh, data-based, it's always going to be out of the U.S. Okay. So anything that we want to do is going to be out of the U.S. So non-farm payrolls, uh, ADP, um, trade deficit, uh, Michigan, the sentiment figures, Philly Fed, all these things you're going to want to look at because they're going to be important. They're going to move the markets. Eurozone, okay, it's obviously been in the news a lot. We've got Mario Draghi talking about quantitative easing. You know, we've got a lot of difficult things to, uh, to, to overcome. And that's what we're trying to do, isn't it? We're trying to overcome all these difficult things and uh, understand what, what these markets are trying to achieve. And the Eurozone, again, good news, bad news. It's going to be really kind of limited to, to the European markets and the Euro. It doesn't really affect the US too much. But it, but it can have a knock-on effect. So US very important to all markets, Eurozone uh, data generally to, to the UK and Euro European markets specifically. Then Germany on its own, it really is the powerhouse behind Europe. So anything growth, anything job, anything to do with strength, you know, it is, is going to be important in the, um, you know, coming out of Germany because Germany, you know, is really kind of bankrolling the rest of Europe. So we have to kind of get on board and... Uh, and you know support Germany because if, if they're not strong enough to uh, prop up the eurozone, then the eurozone's finished, isn't it? Then we've got the UK and Asian markets. I think the UK and Asian markets right now are quite specific. Uh, UK data is very very specific to the UK and Asian markets again specific to the Asian markets. I don't think there's a major deal of crossover in the two right now. Um, but you know again that's, your, that's my opinion. You know, your opinion could be different. So the main figures and currently you know, the other things we should focus on in the US. So non-farm payrolls is the holy grail. It's the biggest figure. Okay, so simply put, it's the employment of uh, around about 70% of the um, uh, working, you know, workforce in America. So the more people working, less people claiming insurance, less people uh, not paying tax, more people buying things, the more the economy is going to grow. So very, very simple to understand. High non-farm payrolls means uh, you know the markets should react positively. So it's generally you know, a, a positive or negative figure. We've been in a positive figure for quite some time, seeing very, very strong figures. What we have seen, though, is a tendency to a jobs to be created, but um, now the average hourly earnings to come down. So more people are working, but for less money. So that's not necessarily a good thing. But as uh, the U.S. is 70% consumption, the creation and maintenance of jobs is absolutely essential. More people buying, you know, the stronger the economy is, you know, the better we're going to do. 
So ISO manufacturing, again, you have to remember the US is a very you know, powerful um, nation for, for manufacturing. And the Institute of Supply and Management um, concentrates on you know, what's happening in that sector. So again, a very reliable piece of information to understand that, again, if a figure is over 50, uh, then it's generally uh, good. And if a figure is under 50, then it, it's bad. So it's, again, another kind of sentiment style figure that if people are happy in manufacturing and, you know, purchases are buying and we're going out, you know, to, to drive the economy forward by purchasing uh, more things to produce more things for more people to buy, then that's positive for the economy. Then you've got the Chicago PMI. Now, this was released on the last uh, business day of the month and indicates the state of the regional manufacturing activity. So, again, this is another good thing to put in the diary. You know, first Friday of every month, there's no farm payroll. Then at the end, you've got the Chicago PMI. So, again, something interesting to look at, isn't it? Something towards the end of the month that might give you an idea of what the market's going to do. So it kind of breaks down things into production, new orders, inventories, uh, employment, and uh, supply delivery. So lots of different things composing and making that Chicago PMI figure. So again, the more things in it, the more complex it is, the more individual elements people will take out of it. But again, something interesting to look at and uh, you know something that is used by professional traders. So we'll move the markets. Then the key kind of figures at the UK, and again, if you could focus on the FTSE 100 or 250, the gilt cable or sterling, these are the things you want to look at. So again, uh, mainly services in the UK. So a lot of service figures are important um, because you know we're very kind of service driven. We don't manufacture things in the UK so much. So um, I would say that the manufacturing services, you know, the monthly uh, PMI figures are good to look at. Consumer confidence, sentiment. Obviously, interest rates are going to be a massive one. Um, after the election in the next kind of couple of quarters. But really, you know, again, anything UK-centric is going to move UK markets. The key figures in the Eurozone, again, will affect the DAX, the CAC, the Euro dollar, um, you know, again, this, maybe the, an SMI to some re, uh, respect. And these are things like, you know, Eurozone manufacturing PMI, again, lots and lots of manufacturing in the Eurozone. Services, again, a big, big industry. German IFO is a, is a good one, a very, very respectable figure. And the German ZEW, we've actually met the guy that does the German ZEW, uh, very German, as you'd expect. But um, yeah, that's a very good um, figure to trade. And again, Germany's a power by in Europe, so it'll affect the DAX CAC and the euro dollar. Again, very interesting to look at. Then you've got the uh, consumer industrial confidence. Again, uh, worthwhile figures to look at. So again, when we're talking about figures and we're talking about what we're trying to uh, get out of these figures, they're either going to be in two economic cycles. They're either going to be in growth or they're going to be inflation. So we've been looking for growth for five, six years, haven't we? So growth is anything to do with job creation, GDP growth, um, you know, service growth, all these kind of different things. Um, we're kind of moving into the inflation cycle now, aren't we, really? The inf inflation cycle you know, is to do with interest rates and to do with things like... Um, you, you know, uh, c controlling stability. You know, was the growth was just kind of, we just do growth at any cost because that's what we required, that's what we needed. Realistically, what we're looking for now is, you know, that stability. And that stability comes really focused around inflation because inflation seems to be a bad thing. But we've got inflation, deflation, joyflation. We've got all sorts of flation, but we don't really know why. And that's because we've kept interest rates historically low and pumped the markets full of quantitative easing. So we don't really know what should be happening. All we know is things are going you know, price-wise above inflation and wages aren't keeping up. But that's understanding the economic cycle. So moving out of the growth uh, figures type scenarios and moving into the um, inflation type cycles. But until we move on interest rates and, and, move, and hike them, then they're still not going to be as, you know, as widely focused on. But uh, realistically... You know, these are the things we're always battling between growth and inflation and understanding what's moving the markets and why. So growth affects all regions. And again, the, 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 the main kind of thing we look at is GDP. So GDP is the main measure of how countries are performing. So if you're trading, you know, the euro versus the dollar, you look at the GDP. You know, what's the GDP and, and debt ratios of the eurozone versus the US? If, you know, eurozone's better, buy some euro. If the, the dollar's better... Buy some dollar. That's re really all we're ever trying to do. Then the inflation, again, all regions. Nobody likes inflation. Nobody likes deflation. Nobody likes inflation being out of control. So what we're always trying to figure out is um, you know, what, what, what it is and what's the target. You know, were we in relation to that target? 
you know, what's good about, you know, this, this particular inflation cycle, what's bad about it. So again, all we're ever trying to do is just figure out what um, the market is expecting and anticipating, if we're in line with that or if we're not. And that means we can trade, you know, correlating products, you know, for and against that. So figures that are going to come into play a lot more uh, now is really the CPI, Consumer Price Index, and the core CPI index. Now, especially I've mentioned the core because uh, we've had a massive decrease in the um, oil prices. So everything is to do with oil. Everything is delivered by some sort of tanker. Everything you know that's produced is made with some sort of oil. And oil, you know, is, is oil. It is what it is. It's part of everyone's lives. So now that has come down. We're getting a distorted view of inflation. That just because you know oil's dropped down and petrol's a little bit cheaper, everyone thinks that you know the the, the CPI, you know, it's coming down. So what we used to pay for stuff is coming down because oil's factored in. No, stuff's the same price, probably more expensive. But just because one element of it's come down. Now, the, the less autos and gas it seem to be the, the most volatile part of it. And that's why we strip it out in the core CPI. But the CPI headline figure is just a measure of what, really, of inflation. It's what things cost this time last uh, uh, month, this time last year. That's what that is. That's what we're trying to achieve by understanding the CPI. And again, it all measures around inflation. So the less autos and gas is just taking that volatile measure out. So sometimes it's a lot better to look at the CPI, um, less autos and gas, and it is the headline figure. But again, it's down to your discretion and what you're trying to achieve from your trading. So as I've always said, there's only three main ways I know of trading any, any kind of economic data, any kind of figure. And that's really um, placing a position before the figure is released or the information is released or placing, uh, placing orders outside the extremes of the range, so stacking up your order book or waiting for the uh, market to release the data and trade the ensuing volatility. These are things that go over on every live trade, okay? because I only know these ways how to trade you know, new information. So trading prior to the release is just that. Now, I've made just as so much money as I've lost. To be honest, why bother preempting the figure? You know, it's... It's, you know, the markets are too complex for that. It just isn't, you know, about that anymore. So we have to understand what's the analysis of the previous figure, how far did the market move, what's the market expecting, what's the profit and loss can, can it be, what involvement can I potentially, you know, risk in, in this data, and what if we get it wrong? So for me, realistically, it's all about, you know, what if scenarios, you know, will I outguess the non-farm payroll? Will I make more if I do this? Will I lose more if I do this? And generally the answer is no. So I would say, leave it. So you can put things in your favor. If you're expecting weaker than expected figures and you're trading towards the top of the range, then there's obviously certain edges you can get. Markets are moving between support and resistance. So if we're coming back to previous uh, resistance and we're trading towards the top of the range and we think the figure is going to be worse than expected and we're trading the stocks, we can actually take a bit of a calculated risk if the market is worse and we know we're kind of protected towards this resistance and can get out of our trades fairly quickly and then let the market sell off. Okay, so, you know, it's like all these things. It's not necessarily a good way to trade. It's not necessarily good, but you can stack it in your favor. If you think it's going to be bad and you think it's going to, um, you know, we're trading towards the top of the range, you can kind of factor in a little bit of the safety element and let the markets come back down. Then we can place limit orders in and outside the market range. So if we're trading in the current range, you know, of, of these levels here, then we know where the highs and the lows are. So what we're trying to do is stack the order book in and around these um, you know, these key figures, aren't we? The, the, these key levels of support and resistance. So what we're looking for is that data to be released, and the market to shoot up and to shoot down and quickly get filled on the highs and the lows and, and try and make some money. So again, what we're looking for you know, is the market, is orders here to maybe you know, let the market bounce, orders up here for the market to sell back down. You know, these are the things what you're looking for, previous support, previous resistance. You know, uh, interest points in the future. So market comes here, you might see a quick bounce and get out. You might see a quick bounce to this level up here and get out. And again, you know, you're not looking to make lots of money from these trades. You're just looking to get in, to get out, and, and steal a bit of profit. You know, it's meant to be getting the extremes of the market, like the elastic band. Market data is released, shoots up, shoots down. You get filled with support and resistance. Let it go, snaps back to uh, to market value, and then you try and make you know that that quick amount of money. So don't turn a, a scalp into a position trade. But don't try and get too much out of it. If you pick the extremes of the market, then that's good. That's a good thing to do. You know? And then get out. Get out for some of that you know, all-important profit. 
the key points to remember when you're placing um, orders out in outside the range. Don't be greedy. You know, if you get filled quickly, you know, make sure you try and get out for some profit quickly. Uh, only use levels that you know for the first five or ten minutes after trading, because that's when the pullbacks occur. If you know, if you try and wait too long, then you, you're certainly going to get um, caught out, and you know the market's not going to act in, in that quick, volatile manner to kind of get in and you know and, and get out of that profit out quickly. And then make sure you cancel the orders. You know, there's no point leaving them in and saying, "Well, that was a good level," you know, five minutes ago. It was five minutes after data. You know, a lot has changed. So you want to again be making sure that you get out. Um, at them good levels, but also that you, know, you cancel orders. You know that weren't they're not relevant now in the in the current market conditions. Now the main way of trading any kind of data is just letting the data come out, letting the first five minute candle close, trading continuation or reversal. Why? It's the simplest way to trade figures. You understand what the market's trying to achieve. You understand what the data is. You understand what the market's then done. That's trading actual fact, trading actual data. Taking that 20% fundamental and then trading it in an 80% fundamental, sorry, technical way. So that is it. You know, don't speculate what the figure might do and try and preempt it. You know, don't try and overcomplicate it. Don't try and cheat it. Just wait for the market to tell you what it's trying to achieve. Yeah. Understand the data and then trade accordingly. So what we do here, we know the market ranges before data is released up here, but we get another opportunity to sell down. So this is the first bit of action after the figures released and the market comes down great but that's fine the action area is really here the market comes down we can sell here tries to move back up and then goes on to make fresh lows so realistically we've got two opportunities to sell and make just as much movement as we did here and that's great that's what we're trying to achieve initial move goes down from here to here okay then we see another spike down and then profit taking and then we move down so that has moved just as much here as it has done here so great, we can make just as much money after the data is released and understand that whatever the news was, sent this market down once and therefore we'll send it down again. So again, it's all about understanding action areas, all about understanding you know, the, the, the continuation and the, and the kind of the markets will go up, they'll come down, people will take profit and then the market will continue. It's all about that continuation and reversal style pattern of trading the markets. All right, guys, well, that's the second part of... Um, you know the trade for life course now. So we've understood why we need a trading plan, the ideals, and uh, you know what we're trying to achieve from having a plan, setting goals, and having all these things to help us. All the planning and, and, and preparation and routines are all really just to kind of get us involved in the markets in a responsible way. Make sure we're not sat there, you know, kind of you know all day, you know, doing nothing, just really kind of reading things over and over again, and not letting it help our trading. Trading the data from the U.S. is absolutely key and absolutely fundamental. And we have to understand what it is, when it is, and what we do with it. And that's, that, again, that all is what we're trying to achieve from trading. Okay, a joyflation is just a, a, another term coins, uh, coined, uh, Rudy, just from, um, you know, just from, the, from the, the, the people that talk about these things. And it's, you know, where you've not got inflation, deflation, after a long staying period of inflation, then it comes down. You have this kind of overcompensating effect and people, you know, kind of, you know, you know, like when the markets overextend and overreact uh, to, to something. That's really what joyflation is. All right, guys. Um, any any questions? Any thoughts? Anything you'd like to ask? Anything that uh, you do or don't understand from this uh, trade for life course tonight? So, like I said, I mean, again, the whole thing, the whole theme is planning, being prepared, and making sure you've got these fundamental news um, events ready. You know, so you can. You know, put them into your trading plan and put them into your, you know, your trading day and week and understand that these are events that you can you know, focus around and get ready to trade. And then understand that all the rest of the time the market moves technically and that's between all these things we're going to go through later in the course, all the fundamentals, all the um, uh, you know, kind of uh, oscillated indicators, all these different things. Uh, no, Jeff, absolutely no way uh, we could have seen the uh, SMB. If all the, the broken houses got caught out and central banks and governments got caught out, how could we, the average guy, know? So absolutely not, I'm afraid. Absolutely no way of being able to uh, to understand the SMB moving that peg against the euro. One of them things, one of them huge data events that catches everyone off guard and uh, you either make money out of it or lose money out of it. You either, it's either a good thing or a bad thing. So. Really tough one. But, uh, yeah, obviously we've got the uh, Eurozone quantitative easing coming out, and we've got all the um, other um, 
again, other things to kind of concentrate on, like the um, interest rates, you know, the UK and Eurozone. These are the kind of real key things that are going to be absolutely, you know, kind of, you know, indicative to uh, to understanding what's going to happen in the future. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I don't know, with gold is difficult, isn't it? Because gold's, you know, again, there's lots of uh, people just automatically going back to, um, you know, gold's a natural safe haven. So people are just jumping into gold and not really knowing why. I think gold's going to probably go a little bit higher before it comes lower. But, you know, we're still at that key monthly 50%. So I think realistically, you know, gold's got some some way to come down uh, just yet. I don't think it's going to... Um, be able to to continue going higher forever because I just don't think the hedge funds are involved. I don't think the you know if you look at gold and and who holds gold, the UK has no gold. Fort Knox is rumored to be empty. So why realistically, you know, we're going to you know make countries that hold a lot of gold uh, better off? You know, these these countries are generally not our allies. You know, like China, for instance, and you know Iraq and Iran and all these kind of places. So I think gold will probably go a little bit higher, but it'll 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 come back down with a vengeance. It's going to hit a thousand dollars. I'm still convinced of that. Yeah, big events like terrorist attacks, you know, again, they don't affect the markets like they used to, but anything serious obviously will. Um, but, you know, we don't really want to, to see that, but it, we just trade. It's just trading news, aren't we? So that's what we're trying to achieve. All right, guys, anything else, you can get me on Twitter, at Steve Ruffley, and uh, just get me on the email, uh, sruffley at tradingmaker.com. Uh, you know how to get hold of me. And anything else, guys, you know, just give me, uh, give me a shout. All right, guys, as always, been an absolute pleasure, and I'll catch you all very soon. All right, guys, good night.